Hey guys, Patrick here from Historia Canadiana, just cutting in a bit at the beginning of the episode because I forgot to introduce certain elements and just talk about some of the things that we usually talk about. First of all, we were joined today by Himanish, who's a Native American from Washington, D.C., and he was gracious enough to come on the show to talk about a figure that is near and dear to his heart in many ways, shape, or form, the trickster figure. And despite his kind of problems with his audio that he faced during the episode, I think the passion for his, uh, for this subject really shines through. And yeah, he kind of relates it back to pop culture often. And as well, obviously provides some really interesting insights into Eden Robinson and her take on the trickster, which is kind of the main focus of the episode today. Also, I wanted to take this time to shout out a great podcast that I think you would enjoy. It's the craft beer talk show hosted by Matt Sanch. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right, where every two weeks, Matt discusses the world of craft beer and some of beer history. So if you really like what we do here on the show, I think you'll enjoy what Matt does, where he kind of combines cultural aspects with history and, you know, kind of reviews some beers that he never tasted for the first time and has some interviews and all kinds of things like that. So it's really quite a fun time. I'm really finding quite a bit of enjoyment out of it. And I think you will too. So obviously also you can support the show through Patreon, through PayPal, leave a review, send us an email, do all of that good stuff that I like to mention at the top of the show and didn't have a chance to while Himanish was on. So yeah, without further ado, I'll let you all enjoy our episode. Cheers. Ooh, also another thing that I wanted to mention before we forget, I also like to shout out our patrons, Elise, Jessica, Craig. So if you want to join them in having an extra episode a month on Pop Canada, so on pop culture in Canada, it's hosted by Mac. It's a great show and you can get it for as little as $3 a month. So you can join them there or you can always donate, like I said, through PayPal. Anyway, now I'm actually done. Cheers. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick and this is the show where we talk about Canadian culture, history, as seen through literature mostly. With me as always is my fantabulous co-host Mackenzie. Hi. <laughs> Very... Nice to be here Patrick. Thanks you, for having doing... me on the show again. Are we doing Kermit always for fun. the entire time? Is that it? Okay. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? Anyway, joining us today, we actually we actually have a very special guest who's already making us laugh and is quite funny and should be a great load of fun with us. Uh, we have Himanish. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes. Yeah, so I am. My name is Himanish Kowal, and I'm a student uh, at VCU uh, who's about to finish his graduation in August this year in Information Systems and a certificate in Human Center Design. And yeah, um, that's kind of my overall introduction because a lot of it has been in academia, so I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay, great. So today we're going to be talking about, generally speaking, the trickster figure as it's well known uh, on the Pacific coast. Now we'll get into the details of that. There's a trickster figure for a great many cultures, not just indigenous cultures, but all over the world, there's that kind of figure that shows up. So we'll get a bit into the details of what that is. But by and large, we're gonna be talking about what that means on the Pacific coast. And the reason for this is, it's kind of our way of introducing British Columbia into the narrative we've been weaving throughout, our, throughout the run of our podcast. And the, we thought that the trickster would be an interesting way to do this because it's a pretty central figure to many Native American and First Nations myths. And yeah, it would be a kind of a fun way to, to start this off. And next episode, we're going to kind of develop that a bit further through a different, uh, through a different type of literature. So just to kind of start us off on this idea, right, I'll throw you all out a question. What exactly is your own knowledge and experience with the trickster myth, right? Um, so Mac, why don't you kick us off, right? What, how do you understand the trickster myth in general? Um, so I know I'm vaguely aware of the trickster archetype. 
And I, because there is an important difference between the First Nations trickster and then what we sort of know as our trickster in sort of Western mythology and culture. So, you know, sort of like the Greek myths and the Nordic myths and all that. And so I was aware of that divide. And so I was aware of certain trickster figures in like the very, uh, the very well known ones, like the coyote, the raven in First Nations sort of myths and stories mm -hmm. but i don't know super in depth i don't have a deep knowledge base on this right absolutely what's the uh, and him and ish on your end what's your relation to the trickster myth or your general knowledge behind it yeah so in terms of the, the trickster myth i think it's kind of both kind of like the cunning and foolish uh, you know exhi exhibiting the one who plays the tricks or disobeys the norm the normal rules for like mm -hmm. um conventional behavior so it's uh, you know an example i like to give is it's like the <laughs> this might really relate to folks in the mcu world, <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. like the, the the mischief maker loki you know he's kind of the trickster who's always shape-shifting his way from mm -hmm. gender variability whether he's you know uh showing himself as captain rogers or whatnot he's always trying to um kind of keep the, the form and barrier, variability of it unknown. And like, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of factors towards those because sometimes you see them on the good side and sometimes you see them on the bad side. And so you have to kind of play it by the, by the game. And sometimes tricksters do end up becoming good people, but it usually takes a long time before they reach that stage. Oh, for sure. I, I, I really enjoy the, the comparison to Loki here. It's just really great. Um, <laughs> because he's I, the trickster that everybody's going to know. Of course. And he's handsome, so might yeah. as well, like, we might as well, <laughs> if we're having, like, an image of a trickster and kind of a foolish figure, it might as well be Tom Hiddleston. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I mean, like, he's, and the thing is, I, w I would have given, like, yeah, so like in the Hindu mythology, there was this really big war called, um, I better not screw this one up. <laughs> there there were several, big, this is like the one in like the old times. The, mm -hmm. It's written in the spiritual holy book called the Bhagavad Gita. They, I think it was Mahabharata or something like that. I don't remember the names. I, I don't want to like start another war on this. But, right, right, right. Um, Pretty much in one of the wars, there was one trickster. Pretty much there was a war between the brothers of the same palace or fighting over the throne. And he told, and so, you know, kind of in a sense of the Joker, he took the side who he knew who wanted to defeat the good loyal brothers. You know, these were ones that wanted the throne like in greed or whatnot. And so he kind of tricked them into saying that, you know, they did this to your palace, you should probably go do this to them. And all of a sudden there would be these random battles and they'd be losing the troops when they're not they were not able to figure out why would they be declaring several war, war wars for no apparent reason. Um and eventually, when they found out about the trickster giving all the notes, um, I mean, they eventually got rid of, the goal was to get rid of him because the word of mouth kind of translates when someone sees someone giving the word and like after that, it, passing it on. And it's like, oh, okay. Then you find like the solution to all your problems. Right. Okay. But that, I think really those two, the, those two ideas that you brought up are are kind of an interesting way of opening up to a bunch of the ideas that we're going to be talking about here. Um, mostly, I have a similar experience with the trickster myth as, uh, as both of you. My knowledge of it comes mostly from contemporary literature in terms of like where indigenous populations are concerned here in Canada. Uh, mostly comes from modern literature. So you have Thomas King, who writes a lot about um, about that figure in things like Green Grass Running Water. And of course, the focus of our episode today, Eden Robinson, was one that used the figure quite a bit, most recently in her trilogy of books. And so just to bring it back a bit, right, just to give a bit of a historical context on how the traditional myth was understood for many First Nations and Native American populations on the Pacific coast and say that it's estimated that where the Pacific coast is concerned, it's estimated that there have been populations on that territory for about 20,000 years at this point. Um, now, obviously, there can be some differences in terms of archaeology and anthropology in this case, but that's a rough estimate. 
And today there are about 200 various First Nations that are recognized in British Columbia alone, with about 30 different languages among them. And that includes Tlingit, Athapaskan, Bellacoola, etc. Now, we've already talked about this, but among the first contacts in terms of how we understand Canada today was with James Cook in the, seven, in the 18th century that led to a whole series of obviously terrible uh, conflicts and interactions, much like we see on the East Coast. But there wouldn't actually be much of a great push for colonization in British Columbia like we saw on the East Coast. That would come a bit more progressively, and we're going to be talking a bit more about that next week, about how that happened. And that mostly came about with things with the Hudson's Bay, Hudson's Bay Company in the 1850s. There were all kinds of uh, shifting arounds in their uh, shifting shifts in their mandate that happened in this time. And, you know, the rise of modern treaty making and obviously a gold rush made it easy to suddenly and very quickly colonize British Columbia. As we were saying at the beginning, and as kind of Mac and Himanish have pointed to, it's very difficult to generalize about any indigenous population, right? Whether they're from the East Coast, West Coast, Plain Natives. But, you know, generally speaking, like we were saying, there are some cultural similarities, even if the specific details are at times a bit different. So on top of the trickster myth that we'll see a bit more of, one of the things that Pacific indigenous populations are known for are things like the potlatch, right? which was generally a gift-giving ceremony or event that often was accompanied by something a bit greater. Right? So the, a, a new chief was put into place, or uh, there was a marriage, or even a death at times, so some kind of event or ceremony that had the goal of redistributing some wealth and some food to the population and kind of bring together a whole series of groups and cultures. And this is actually a practice that lasted about 4,000, uh, that's been around for about 4,000 years. And I'm mentioning it here because again, we're going to bring it up at a later episode because it becomes, specifically the potlatch, becomes a significant point of contention between the British and Canadian governments and Native American tribes in the Pacific coast. It, is, it will be outright outlawed, and it will lead to all kinds of conflicts between the many groups and the Canadian government. Apparently the word potluck actually comes from potlatch. Probably. Yeah, that doesn't no, surprise no, me at it all. It is. Yeah. Like, it's so, uh, there's, there's the, what's the word again? A bit of conflict, I guess, in the etymology community. But it's either potlatch or there it's the words pot and luck from a European perspective. Right. Interesting. Okay. And how long, like, when did the, <laughs> we're just randomly shifting into etymology, but when did the actual word potluck come into the English language? I'm curious now. Oh, let me see. Does um, it say? It doesn't say much. Okay. It originated in 1930s in the Depression. Oh, oh it okay. used, appears in the 16th century English work of Thomas Nash, but then sort of the, the modern idea of it happened in the 1930s in the Depression because everybody was just doing potlucks because mm. that's all you had. Okay, right. And like, yeah, I can see why that would be contentious because like you say, in the 16th century version, they wouldn't have necessarily known about the British Columbian version of it or the mm -hmm. Pacific Coast version of it, but it had a different meaning then. But even the 16th century version is like a giving of food or something. It's weird. Oh, okay. Hmm. I'll have to look more into that. That's probably something we'll address on the later episode. I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> So great. I mentioned, right, that we were going to be talking, right, about the trickster figure and that we're going to be mostly focusing not only on its traditional sense, but how it's come to be, uh, how it's come to be known today, right? mm -hmm. especially within Indigenous communities. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about it through the lens of Eden Robinson's book, Son of a Trickster. Now, Son it's trickster. been turned into a trilogy, or I think the second one of three has come out. I don't think the third one has come out yet, but there's really some interesting stuff going on with that book that I thought would be interesting to bring up. Um, so again, I guess a question to the two of you, just so I don't take up all the airtime of talking. Um, have either of you read Eden, Eden Robinson or been aware of her books? Fortunately, no. Okay. But I'm looking at it now and it actually looks kind of interesting. I might have to go take a look at it in my spare time. Yeah, she's really, I think you'd like her. She has like a specific type of writing that I think you would mm -hmm. really enjoy. Um, and I'm, I'm actually quite surprised. I was saying that before, uh, we started recording, um, I'm really quite surprised you haven't read her because one of her best known books, uh, her second novel, I think it's, it is Monkey Beach. 
is very well known and very often used within contemporary Canadian literature courses. So it, it's become quite a staple of the curriculum, at least here in Quebec. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. So I, I'm, that's why I was kind of expecting you to have read some, because I know you've taken a few Canadian uh, literature classes. Um, and on your end, uh, Himanish? Yeah. So, yeah. So I've been, read The Son of a Trickster. And when you mentioned Monkey Beach, the, the word kind of fizzled a bit with me still. but uh yeah it the, the son of a trickster is a is definitely a trilogy because she has trickster drift that came out the year after that right. and then the return of the trickster in i think this year so oh, okay so it has come out yeah so that yes yeah, it is kind of like a trilogy um that she was trying to create from 2017 till now mm -hmm. but you, you know, I think if for folks that have read a, The Son of a Trickster, they can pretty much relate that it enhances its core concepts on like, it's like a, it's like a coming of age novel. That's right. one thing, because it's showing how the boy is in a situation where he's seeing himself with pressure, a family that's not as well managed, um, and then all these other appliances like alcohol and drugs and all that and so when you get in from my perspective when you get into all of those when you start to touch on those little things in your life right. it starts to make a difference in terms of if someone offers you something which even doesn't look as it which looks a little a bit different or not and kind of taking you out of this uh you know dull life or this extreme change of what's happened within to you they would have from any you know story plot that i've seen that character ends up taking that because they want to discover what is this and so he kind of discovered the trickster which was um widget and mm -hmm. it, it, it and i think the story was set on like the british columbia yep. uh kitty mount so that's yeah you know and for folks that are not book readers there is definitely a television series yeah the it's i just think that what she was trying to show is that any age of a person could get into it's not a trap it's just a way of how when you're in kind of an addiction how something that will help get out of it or kind of promote that is like a string attached to it right so she really knows how to wrap her audience around a story that's very relatable in oh yeah today's industry <laughs> absolutely I, I think you bring up a really interesting point because one of the things that she's well known for is very much taking these traditional myths and symbolisms and even storytelling techniques from yeah. her culture so she's both part of the Heisla and Heltsuk I hope I'm not butchering those uh, names First Nations, right? So she does, she does have obviously a background that is Native American and she uses a lot of these techniques that she was raised on to tell a story that seems fresh and relevant, right? You're absolutely right, Himanish, on that. And it's very interesting to me that in many of her novels, or at least those I've read, you're, you're right in saying that there's very much this sense that you get something that's raw and real but still intrinsically tied to this more cosmic and mythological sense, right? It's greater than what any of the characters were ever expected going into it, which I think is, is very this interesting. Is, this is a great comparison because coming back to Loki. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it really shows how, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, for folks that have seen the show and the ones who haven't, <laughs> I will not spoil it for you. Please don't. Sure. I haven't started it yet. Okay. Loki show? Oh, it's so good. <laughs> It's so fine. I'll probably first... get to it in like a year at this point. No, so <laughs> it's, it's fine. I'll forget. <laughs> so, uh, but pretty much when you see Loki start out, right, in like the Thor series, the Avengers, and Dark, mm. kind of like all the films that he's been in, you see him as this very cunning villain where he has tricks up his sleeves that kind of want, I mean, it engages the audience, but for folks that like to see those types of behaviors, he kind of hits on the, the nail of that really well. But then if you look at the new season, or if when you see him in Thor Ragnarok, you see how his arc dramatically curves. Because I think the last time that we see him before Ragnarok, I, I, I could be wrong with my timing, was either the cameo in Doctor Strange or it was in Dark, Thor, the, Thor the Dark World. Because sure. after that, we didn't really see him as... 
it was like a huge right. weight. And if you see him in that, it kind of looks like he's involved because now Odin looks at both of them as his sons. And so he kind of has this relationship versus this against feeling mm-hmm. um, towards him. And then you see how the character improves. And he's now looking, it's like you're seeing him more than the villain as like the hero of his own story. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of goes to like how... You, you get on the path, but that does not come to say that you can never get, you can shift towards it at certain times that are uh, impacts or events that help change it. Uh-huh. Right. But just before we get too far into this, like, I, I think a lot of the, again, you know, like the ideas that you bring up here relate back quite interestingly to like the actual myth itself, right? That Eden Robinson is playing with. So just to give a bit of context as to who the trickster figure actually is within a lot of these uh, indigenous stories, right? So as we said earlier, there's plenty of variations, mostly in the details, but I think you're right in pointing out, for example, that the trickster figure is often this hero, anti-hero type, right? So he plays plays both someone who either is directly heroic or does something bad and ends up doing something good unbeknownst to that figure, right? Or uh, completely without necessarily intending to do so. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you, know, you, you mentioned that at the beginning of, of, our, uh, of our discussion when you were mentioning, oh, okay, just what you knew about the trickster figure in general. You're saying, you know, folklore often dictates social behavior, right? Mac, you might be able to speak a bit more about that, but generally myths and stories tend to dictate and talk about what people should or shouldn't do within a community. And the trickster exists kind of as this chaotic figure that can break these mores and then rearrange them in order to fit new ones and reinscribe certain mores and traditions onto, uh, onto a story and onto a community by extension. Yeah, um, that's definitely. And I think, again, though, you have to sort of look at that distinction of the sort of first native, and as far as a mythological sense goes, the first native yeah. and then the sort of like European Greek myths, and then the First Nation sort of trickster and those sort of myths, because you have, yeah. there's less of a trickster presence in those sort of Europe. There is a trickster, like Loki's a trickster, but he's much more a villain. Yes. And yes, he'll be pushing those norms, but in the end, he's always portrayed in that villainous light, whereas First Nation stories and myths and their culture sort of has these tricksters being more anti-heroes or heroes in their norm breaking Mm -hmm. so that sort of portrayal makes a big difference even somebody like loki now he's getting in the more contemporary sense but that's sort of more reflective of our social values we like tricksters and scrappy fighters and all that now Mm -hmm. but in that traditional classical sense they're very much punished any time that somebody helps break the norm, Prometheus brought fire to humans, and then he got his liver eaten out on re- on repeat for years, every day. <laughs> yeah. Just like yeah. casual brutality by the Greek gods yeah. right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's that he, Trixus can also fake the image of what they really are, because he, he, he'll fake what he, what seems to be what he is in the cage, but, what, but really, he's not that person this is very relatable to when you see folks outside when if you if you actually peel the layers you'll see something else but when you see them you'll see it's like it's all covered up you won't see ever you know the naughtiness behind them so yeah even like the i mean even though he's been shown in one film but when jim carrey played the mask he was kind of playing the role of a trickster because he was not the villain. He mm-hmm. was not the hero. He was kind of doing the oddball things where, you know, just whenever he wore that mask. Yeah. Otherwise, he was completely fine. Honestly, if you want a, a strange comparison to make, but in many Shakespearean or Renaissance plays, you have the fool, the mm-hmm. character known as the fool. In a lot of ways, that's the trickster. They aren't the villain. They're, they're an observer, a watcher, and it is their job to then poke holes in everybody's judgment and everybody's decisions yeah. and get away with it while talking about how foolish everything is yeah i think uh, that's definitely something interesting because if we look at like if i want to bring bring it back to not that i could talk about loki all day but just to keep it on topic right i, I have this interesting collection um that was written if i remember correctly in the 50s that is a study about the trickster figure as it as it's understood in native american myth and in it, Paul Radden, the uh, author, gives a summary of the Tlingit version of the myth, which is from the Pacific coast, as I mentioned earlier. And when I read it, the trickster is a horrible character. 
And I mean this in the sense of like, there is some horror level stuff going on in the, in the actual story. Like he, the, the raven in this case, which as Mac mentioned, is one of the forms that the, the trickster often takes, especially on the West Coast and mm-hmm. in Eden Robinson's book as well. Uh, Weejit takes the form of a raven. You know, the raven kills all kinds of animals. It causes all kinds of chaos. And it's definitely not a character that from our Western perspective, we're used to liking at all. Um, And I can definitely understand why a lot of missionaries and colonialists associated the trickster figure with the devil. A lot of elements of Native American myths, because they're so seemingly from an outside perspective, clear cut as to good and evil, right? They can very much be turned into these categories. The last time we talked about this, uh, it was about the great spirit, the Manitou, which was often interpreted as a kind of God, as a singular great spirit God. But it's not at all that. There's much more complexity to it. It's hard for us to even comprehend it. For sure. As, like, you know, as you know, now we sort of understand these these First Nation Native American tricksters as the devil is what they're often compared to, but that's not the case at all. No. Their tricksters created things. The coyote was known for molding man out of clay. The raven yeah. put the stars in the sky and created the sun and the moon and gave us light. Yeah. And that's that's definitely something that you see in Eden Robinson, though. Right? Oh, At yeah. the very end of the book, spoilers, right? When uh, Spoilers for this, like, five-year-old book at this point. <laughs> but when the main character, when Jared, Jared actually, actually meets six-year-old. the trickster, he's confronted with this being that's kind of tormented him throughout the text. And the trickster still yeah. tries to be with him and tries to associate with jared at the very end of the text being like no i can be good for you i can offer you this kind of change that you need in your life yeah Uh, sorry i wanted to say something yeah so like tricksters are one very good convincers Mm -hmm. um can get them can get the other side to come on their side to come on their side without even thinking at first sight and they love extremely love chaos because yeah. the more chaos the more the more it builds the more they can attract people they can attract audience because they want to be this the, think of it as this is this might this is might not be a very good example but think of it that they want to be on ted talk they want to be on the ted talk but not actually talk about it ex- except spoil the platform <laughs> so that's that's their that's their ultimate kind of like ultimate goal as like where they want to go between the fine line of good and evil mm-hmm. because from all those characters that we mentioned in like the cinematic form mm-hmm. there's a kind of where it's like the simple ac- acronym or like metaphor you'd want to use is wrapping them around your finger. It, it's it's like it's all about them. They see what they want and they feel like what they want will help being a better um, will help end up being the better self of themselves. And a lot of the times, tricksters are the ones that gain the most attraction out of the whole Looney Tunes. Why is Bugs Bunny the headline? There's 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 all the other ducks and whatnot. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Did you, before we get like more into the book and how it works and, and, and stuff like that, did either of you have anything to say on more on the trickster idea just to kind of introduce us into the, into the topic? Mac, did you Which want to say trickster something? do you want to talk like, about? I, like say just for the purposes of our topic here, more of like the Native American one, but if you have something to say about the right. general figure <clears throat> of the trickster as well as a chaotic figure, that's cool too. Yeah, it's, it's well, the, the Native American one sort of gives that idea from chaos comes creation. And mm-hmm. that sort of builds again on that sort of cycle that they have, the difference in their culture. They're not trying so much to build upon that order and keep tradition. You know, they're sort of trying to have new things, new ideas coming in. The world yeah. is ever changing and we are changing in our place in it. Yeah, that's something that, again, I'll, I'll kind of reference that one again. I know there are plenty of other studies on tricksters and all that. There's a really great one that came out liter- uh, that I'll link to in the description. Talks about it more from a modern perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's something that Radin mentions in his book is, you know, he literally calls it a trickster cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting to me. I think you bring up a really great point where in this case, in the book, he points to 70 kind of uh, 70 uh, kind of points or story beats that the myth often hits upon before allowing it to start up again at the top. Mm -hmm. Right. And it definitely points to in a story structure kind of way, exactly what you're pointing to the idea of recreation. 
and being able to come up with new ideas despite this story, quote unquote, kind of ending. Uh, and I think that's integral to the trickster myth, uh, which I find really interesting that you brought up. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So like both as a figure he creates from chaos, but also as a story, it kind of represents that as well, um, which I find really cool. Yeah. So, speaking of which, I think that's something that is kind of played with in Son of a Trickster, in a sense. Um, I don't know if you've ever, I, I know Mac, you didn't really read the book. You mostly stuck to the TV show. Um, no, I didn't read to see the TV. I looked more about the book. Than I oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I looked but, more up more about like tricksters and trickster myths more than I did the book and the TV show. Fair enough. Um, but I feel like that's something that's definitely played with a bit in the story. Um, now I haven't read the sequels yet. I haven't, uh, I didn't even know that. Right. Okay. So we're just <laughs> going to stick with son of a trickster. Then there's something that him and Ish mentioned at the beginning of the story, uh, at the beginning of our recording is that, you know, Jared is a 16 year old that suffers from a lot of problems. He comes from a dysfunctional family. He suffers with alcohol, with drugs. His personal relationships at school are all out of whack. And you brought up the fact that it's a coming of age story. And I would definitely agree with that, not just because he's a teenager, but because he's actually trying to become a fully fledged and grown up human being in this world that is actively working against him, both in a modern sense of how we treat Native American populations in general in Canada and in the US, but in how, you know, on a more if you want to take a more mythical approach to it, how he relates to like where, where his actual place in the world is. So he's actually coming to terms with a lot of these things. And so I think this cycle comes up insofar as he's reinventing himself, right? He's starting on this self-destructive path of alcoholism, drugs, a mother who he has a tenuous relationship at best with, and yet he still finds room to grow through his encounter with Weejit, uh, the raven trickster, and rebuild a lot of these relationships by the end of the book. Right? Rebuild them on new ground, on new footing. And I think that's definitely Eden Robinson nodding to or pointing to this kind of cycle. Um, I don't know if either of you thought about that one in particular, but I thought that was kind of cool uh, to bring up uh, just off of your cycle thing. Yeah. See, in the Son of a Trickster, there's there's multiple elements that Eden Robinson trying to play with. Mm -hmm. As coming up the ages, like if you look at it, it's like as a, it's like the web, right? That's the main top. Yeah. She puts the in uh, in. I am not able to talk now. Indigenous no, <laughs> beliefs, the crazy family dynamics, cannibalistic river otters, and all these other like this this the the problems that the son is having, and everything that's kind of revolving around this novel and making Jared the center. And you know, with all like his mom being extremely scary and the pot, the heart of gold, and like mm -hmm. the, the the nature, it's like you can see where he's having a problem to fit himself in, and that's how every book. If the only way you're able to sell the story is if the character has a problem which you can connect with where you can with jared martin in this case who's a 16 year old um cookie dealer right okay. quote so, unquote cookie dealer, cookie dealer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> so um you know it's like his mom who's extremely violent and is like mm -hmm. has a string of danger with just everything around her yeah. and her and his um and just him trying to help his uh, his father Phil yep. it, it, to pay the rent. It's like he's trying to do the good, and he's also trying to manage the bad. And then he's also trying to seek love from his uh, grandmother and grandfather. Yep. And I think, like, um, granddaughter even. I know his grandmother's name is Nana Sophia. Right. And, you know, it's like he's he's trying to he I think one time in the story he thought of moving in with them but yeah. he, he had trouble figuring out which how to cut the ties between his mom and dad and like how would he want to help the homeless in the end or would he not you know so mm -hmm. you see him making decisions and kind of falling flat and kind of like how I like to look at it as like falling forward trying to figure out where his next step is when he really doesn't know and not sure if he should follow his heart or if he should be with his uh, immediate family members and and one thing that I I don't know if you've noticed in the story, he tries to use the addiction for him to cope with his problem, which is the marijuana and alcohol. And mm -hmm. that's with every story you see. Well, anywhere that where the characters 
heavily in use now, which I can't remember as an example like I did for right. Loki. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he, you know, he's gone through several visions of himself, seeing him in a specific limelight, and I think he's been very vivid and persistent to how to not worry about his sanity. So mm-hmm. I know I said a lot of big words, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just trying to form the because. Folk, I'm trying to f- look at it as like the folks that who haven't read it, how to convince them to read it, and the folks who have read it, you know, to see where I'm going with this. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about that. It's an underlying idea of all our episodes. <laughs> it's like, it's always better if you actually read the text. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and in this case, right, a, a lot of our recent episodes have been focusing on these really old authors that are kind of boring to read now. But in this case, it's written with our modern sensibilities in mind, or at least more modern sensibilities, and it's definitely worth looking into, absolutely. So talk about it as best suits you. And yeah, it's always an implication that find the text. It's easy to find. Uh, Eden Robinson is in so many bookstores. It's great. Oh, yeah. Plus, if you don't like reading, like we mentioned, there's a TV show uh, that's great. Uh, unfortunately, it CD. will stop at one season because of a controversy surrounding it with the oh, showrunner, no. uh, who turned out not to be Native American, despite claiming oh, that no. she was. So unfortunately, CBC pulled the plug on that one. Well, fortunately, in this case, because it was a shit show, uh, Mm -hmm. what happened behind the scenes. So look that up. It's uh, available for free on CBC if you want to look it up there. But unfortunately, you won't be getting a season two of that. I don't know. I can kind of come back to this idea of how Michelle Latimer was canned from uh, from the show, because I think there's something to mention about that in terms of how Eden Robinson writes her stories and how that plays into real life Western co-option by a lot of stories. That can be really interesting to unpack, but we'll uh, maybe see about that later. I wanted to touch upon something that you mentioned, uh, him and Ish, this idea of the web that's kind of created in the story. Mm. Which I think is kind of cool because when you look at it from a general perspective, kind of pulling back, it seems like this weird thing that doesn't really have a through line, right? His, like you said, his grandmother fears him, especially at the beginning because she, no, his mom, his mom fears him. His yeah, mom no. fears him. I, I think his, uh, uh, I, I remember his grandmother having something to do with it also because, uh, or it might have been on the other side of the family, not his mother's mom, but his. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. The the other one who feared him because of the idea of him being potentially related to the trickster figure, and this whole idea of fearing the chaotic change is definitely present as a theme throughout the novel, whether it comes from the mother or one of the grandmother or other characters, and I think you bring up a really interesting point that points to how this. Uh, trickster myth functions is that it looks like a chaotic web and a lot of Native American stories uh, do sound like that right especially from an outsider point of view they don't really have the same structure as we're used to in uh, for example in western cultures but there is a thematic through line and there is kind of something holding it all together in this case it's Jared this kind of next generation of a trickster um, but I do think that it's a very interesting way that you put it, right? This web, something that this is web. intricately placed and intricately yeah. designed, but that is ultimately, if you look at it, sometimes there's some uneven things going on and it's not necessarily something that seems consistent. Uh, I think n- knowing her other works uh, that she's written, especially, like you see that in Monkey Beach as well, although I think to a lesser degree. Yeah, um, way less degree. <laughs> absolutely. But the the idea, right, of it is is that she kind of uses the, 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 it comes back to what I was saying, that she kind of uses these storytelling techniques and makes them fresh and new and modern. And I think that's one of the ways that she does that and that she does it deliberately in this case. I don't think it's an accident. Um, yeah, you were saying... Um, I don't know. It's a few times that you mentioned, right? Monkey, Monkey Beach, like, yeah, way less. Did uh, you read that one, right, Himanish? I don't think I ever got a chance to finish it, but from what she was trying to pitch for the Monkey Beach was that <sighs> Son of a Trix and Monkey Beach are two different tangents mm-hmm. because Son of a Trix is really focused on Jared and how he's kind of going through this emotional journey to kind of find his end goal, whereas the Monkey Beach is kind of it's very, this, and this one's based on a different gender, which is a woman. It's based on Miss Hill. I can't say her first name right. right. But 
Um, she, she, this is more like she's lost in the sea through certain circumstances, and then she's trying to wait on the news for her brother, but she's finding these certain events which are kind of leading to circumstances, so like not letting her push through it. So that one, I mean, it has a, it has like a flavor of coming age, but this is more of like lost and mystery, if you look at mm-hmm. it. Uh, and so the son of a trick, the, the web thing that I mentioned, the web can only be placed on like coming age novels. Like, yeah, <laughs> because you see, it's like a, that, I don't know if you've heard of like ancestry.com, but there's like webs coming out where you can see the dots of where they started and where they ended. It's like, mm-hmm. if it's like, that is one series or novel that if you start at the way if you read the first chapter and you read the last chapter you won't know what went through because you did not see the um the change throughout the story and that's where we see jared going from a very bad circumstance and seeing himself where he's not in you know in a healthy zone of just kind of in a bad light where he's trying to manage the good and evil Mm -hmm. to somewhere around finally realizing that he's uh, like realizing that he one he he put him himself in a situation where he's where he's put he's done all these mistakes and he's trying to figure out how to like patch them up and like not be his version of what his mom is and yeah. what his mom has interrogated him about the night when she blames uh when he mm-hmm. blames her for her sarah's help yeah. but you know he is that where you see the comparisons and the relationships and even um when i think it was sarah when she talked about the flyer fires that it, it was like she was coming home but it was she felt like it was she was being alive for the first time yeah. so you know that that quote quote unquote says it all um so yeah i um i really like the idea that you were bringing up of this generational gap right between his mother and himself uh, i i put it down in the notes so but i i think it's a good time to to kind of bring it no no no. but i, I think it's a good time to bring it up because i i do like it right the book is called son of a trickster in that there there's like this thing going forward right you're you're kind of renewing this whole idea for a new generation and I think this idea works on multiple levels. Um, yeah. So, yeah, not only does it work with what you were saying, right, his mother and himself, and obviously Widget and Jared, because he's the son of Widget. <laughs> so obviously, as the name yeah. implies, he's the son. Um, but I do think that, and this is kind of why I mentioned Monkey Beach, I do think that... Eden Robinson does something very interesting in this in that she brings up a new version of this trickster myth that more actively expresses a lot of the complaints and the, uh, and the kind of concerns while expressing a way in which they can be uh, addressed for indigenous populations in Canada, right? And I think she does that in a more yeah. effective way than in Monkey Beach. Not that Monkey Beach is bad yeah. at all. I really liked that book. But, <laughs> yeah. um, right, there, I think there's a reason why it's taught, as we mentioned before, in so many can lit classes. Mm-hmm. And it's because it kind of fits within a lot of ideas and expectations in terms of story, in terms of structure, in terms of our own understandings of Native populations that make it easier to address in conventional university classes, right? Um, yeah. And I think that's something... Yeah, I think that's something that Son of a Trickster kind of goes away from, both on a structural level, on a story level. There's all kinds of themes that, and symbols that are put into the book that are sometimes never explained. Things just happen, right? Uh, and that's something that's really cool is that, you know, sometimes in the chapters, there's just a chapter that'll start. It's an excerpt of a text, of a story, of a myth, and then move on. And you never really get much of an explanation for it until the very end when it all kinds of comes together. Yeah. And the- I think that's really fascinating in terms of the way that she writes the story that really reflects a new generation and this kind of bringing in to a modern audience the idea of the trickster. Yeah. And when, when, and when you know, all the points you mentioned are right on, especially when you say that she's bringing in an audience of like the trickster folks that see them in that, that kind of suit, of, suit, uh, suit and armor. Mm-hmm. Because the whole point of the coming in age novel, like, 
scope is to kind of show a different perspective towards what you think could be possible and when they and because since tricksters is also one of myth it's like when you implement the history and also put your own story spin to it and you mash it and you kind of blend it well where you you kind of use the phrases here and there where it's applicable it makes the story more refined because now you're relating it to old history to current society and this and this reminds me about the book which I read when I was in school. <laughs> like, okay. I think this is in the eighth grade. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, To Kill a Mockingbird. Of the one course. That no. really... Who hasn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to kill, you know, that that really relates to how his two kids, I don't, it's been a while since I've read the story, but mm -hmm. their, I think their dad was a lawyer yep. and how the other, the neighbor, their house is always dark because one had a certain problem, but you can see how the strings attach and same goes with the outsiders. That's the, and that's the same point with what she's trying to bring into um, the son of a trickster, right. as you mentioned, right. you know, she, I think the characters from like, like Jared Mar Martin, who's like what the 16 year old protagonist, mm -hmm. he's kind of, he was not the hu he was not human, but the trickster spirit made him put a face to it. Yes. Okay, and, that's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so every time he's, you know, he would feel like there was a part of him where he didn't see that Maggie and Bill would, were like kind of in terms swords. Mm -hmm. It came back to, okay, you know do I, am I this, am I this drug addict or this someone with explosive bouts outburst and just so, someone who does, who can't handle himself? Mm -hmm. Or is he the one that has the big mouth that gets him into trouble in like unpredictable environments? And like, even though he had the empathetic and compassionate, just like how Loki from MCU does, he's, it's like, he's, he's mostly feeling more responsible towards his parents than they do for him because he's a trickster now. Yeah. Um, so this is what coming of age novels do. They don't make the character as simple as the, you would in like a Hardy Boys or even like a, um, can't think of action novels. Sure. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever all the die other hard. action, <laughs> die hard. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> they, 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 they don't become that simple because it's like their main goal is towards one, some mm -hmm. is towards one thing even though they might have a little twist here and there, coming age novels really has the character thinking right. you know, in depth. Yeah. I wondered, uh, Matt, just because you haven't spoken in a while, I, I wondered if you had <laughs> anything to say about this. <laughs> because, about the... Yeah, just uh, as a coming of age story, like the trickster myth uh, reproduced in this novel as a coming of age story, or just any of it, right? We were talking about the co-option by, uh, by you know, Western uh, powers of this myth. Like, if you had any thoughts, because I don't want to like go um, off on a tangent before you have a chance to say anything. A yeah. lot of stories are coming of age stories, and it's also because you have that stretch of age from young to basically 18 and anything in there can be a coming of age story sort of growing up peter pan is a coming of age story in many That's ways fair. alice in wonderland all these sort of children's fantasy tales but then you can move the age group on up and then a lot of ya books mm -hmm. end up being coming of age stories that way for sure and so you were going to say something about co-option yeah yeah so using the word co-option in regarding the trickster myth is an interesting word to use because we have our own tricksters and there's just sort of become this blend of putting it all together into mm -hmm. sort of one archetype of the trickster. Yep. So again, we definitely, I won't say don't call it a co-option, but I will say, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to, it's more just a natural thing that just sort of happened. We just sort of kept using our own tricksters as well. We've always had these ideas of tricksters. It's just now they're a bit, now it's a bit more in style to have them be sympathetic. Right. That's just sort of what we like right now. We like the bad boys, mm -hmm. the heart yeah. of gold. Absolutely. It's, so it's interesting to me, I guess, just because I, uh, uh, we, and we can go for, for, for a while now, but we've already been talking for about an hour. So we'll kind of, uh, we'll kind of wind down, I guess, eventually, but the, there's something that I wanted to mention vis-a-vis, -vis, right, this whole coming of age thing and kind of relate it back to the history, right? Because the whole point of this episode was kind of introducing the general idea, the central figure of Native American myths in BC and in the Pacific coast, um, I always I thought it was interesting. I, I wrote this down as well, so as to not forget it. But this interesting parallel, right, between how the trickster 
as we've seen through, uh, through Eden Robinson, and just as a general idea, as the cycle, right, of creation and chaos and recreation and destruction can kind of represent this coming of age, right? Whether obviously Native Americans uh, used that term 20,000 years ago, obviously not, maybe, or I don't know, I don't know any Native American language, so I wouldn't know how to translate it. But, you know, this idea kind of definitely permeates. It's interesting how, again, to kind of bring it back also to this idea of co-option, often we place for a variety of reasons, right, Native American uh, societies against, right, quote unquote, European progress, right? So there is this advancement and this bringing of new stuff that in this case was destructive, right? It brought a completely new status quo for Native American populations. It brought a completely new status quo for European populations as well, in a sense. So it's kind of interesting that you have these two ideas of kind of coming of age and uh, civilizational progress as it was conceived for a long time coming together in a sense in Eden Robinson as this text that simultaneously like I said uses a lot of the trickster storytelling techniques and Native American storytelling techniques and putting them in a form that is intrinsically European at its core right the novel was developed over there as a result as Mac has mentioned many times on the show as a result of exploration right it emerged from the travel novel so to me, there's this really interesting merging and recreation in itself that's going on in the form of the story that I think makes this novel all the more interesting to look at. Um, I don't know if either of you had anything to say about that or to add to that, but I guess that's kind of, it, to, to go off what him and Ish was saying, that's kind of my pitch as to why you should read this, because it just recreate something new out of what you generally expect or based on uh, uh, despite the assumptions that we'd have about either Native American myths or European novels right and kind of plays with both by using oral traditions right by bringing in that writing style that is I think very much influenced by the way that people speak rather than the way that people write. Uh, or at least I got that sense by, by reading it. And I think that's a very interesting way of transitioning the story into the modern world while still rooting it deeply in this tradition. Um, and I think that's just another way, and I'll stop there. I think that's just another way in which it resists co-option in a sense by being this kind of weird merger of everything that you'd expect, it kind of defies categorization and it defies this kind of uh, use by people like uh, Michelle Latimer, right, in the creation of the story that would seek to use it for their own benefit and for their own agenda in this case. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you either of you had anything to say about this or if you wanted to say any final thoughts or had any other things that you wanted to mention about the, the story in general, right? I'm just, like I said, we've been going at it for an hour, so I just yeah. want to kind of wind down. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I think I might have, like, some final thoughts, which sure. is, like, ba going on based on what you said, like, how just the structure of how it helps you figure out the different identities, what a trickster um, possesses, might be the word that I, I use right now. <laughs> I think the main idea, what Eden Rob tried to touch on, is that he's, that, from all the characters that you see, whether it's Jared, his mom, dad, Nana, the widget, the Raven trickster, or the Namgis, or he'll suck, whoever he's being tossed around towards that, he's obviously, it was a part of his, well, I wouldn't say part of his journey, but it's what led him to talking to the Raven trickster that led him to all these other journeys of the, the elderly the elderly neighbors or just, you know, the the his friends like Blake and Kelsey, you know, everyone he's met. I think you have to look at it in terms of one, the coming age being one of the factors. Second, looking at all his identities from one way he started, one where he became kind of the trickster and how he saw the struggles and reflection and just the way they the way she's the thing i like that eden robinson did was how sometimes she would i don't know if this was her own like she sneakily did this but there was always a new character entry somewhere or the other she used to enter a character that would be very relevant mm -hmm. where there was a native man telling jared that you know Weejit and his real father were a bit crazy or whoever it was 
you would see these like fluctuations of everything being normal and like the climax hitting in like the beginning of the story and then yeah. winding down in like the middle or like hitting back at like the end and it's like it's like a sort of a graph that shows his his stroll of emotions that he's having to get himself through so i think for folks that are wanting to see the, the depth and breadth of shades of a shapeshifter you could kind of say or like someone who's seen many identities from the other person's perspective or he himself going through several identities this is definitely a book that will help sh one show you and guide you through that absolutely i think that was intentional i think you're right in that uh, uh mac did you have anything that you wanted to add or say to a final thoughts whether it's final thoughts or just throw out an idea and we'll talk for another hour no maybe not i have to go do groceries but yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, I definitely am interested to read the book just because I think mm -hmm. there's an interesting, and it's always, the supernatural is always the best way to get your point across and discussing the themes and metaphors of what you're trying to do. Absolutely. Just because you get to make those metaphors and themes a reality. True. Yep. <laughs> the goggle doesn't look like it has to be alive. It can just be alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I'd be curious, I, I haven't finished this TV series, um, but I'd be curious to kind of look at it a bit more because I do think it actually strikes that balance between grounding it in reality, right? Um, just because of the nature of what the CBC is here in Canada. Mm -hmm. It has a more limited budget than, say, American TV shows. We've talked about this a lot. Um, but it has to inevitably, through its production methods, ground a lot of the stories that it does. But it still really finds that balance that you kind of alluded to, Mac, of doing something a bit more uh, mythological in its scope, right? And it kind of really stylizes itself in trying to, to, I guess, reach this point of magic realism that we've talked about sometimes on the show um, that that I think is really interesting to play with. I I really should have finished the TV series before watching, the, uh, before recording this, but it might have been an interesting parallel. But no, I think that's pretty much a good point. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Well, if there's nothing else that we wanted to add, like I said, we probably missed a bunch of, of yeah. topics that we that we could have talked about. But, you know, like it or not, we are limited in time. And we if we had actually talked about this, we could talk about it for three hours. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> think anyone wants that. So uh, we'll pretty much cut it here. Himanish, um, before you go, do you want to tell, is there anywhere that people can reach out to you if you want? If you have nowhere, that's fine. Just Tell us a bit about where they can reach you if people have questions or if, yeah, if you want to be on more shows, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, any tricksters or non-tricksters out there that want to follow me, you can, you can find me through uh, my major, the one platform I'm pretty active on is LinkedIn and Reddit. Okay. So you can find me through those, but I also have an Instagram and Facebook account where you 0, 0.0 multiple zeros and a one after it, you not be able to find me in that, but I am on there. <laughs> So, yeah, those are the four platforms that I'm active on. So Great. If you want to send them to me, I'll link them in the show notes, and people will be able to follow him and Ish or ask him questions or reach out to him through those platforms. And if you are a trickster, let me know. <laughs> that way I can accord, because it's easy to know who the non-tricksters are, but if you are, be blunt about it. <laughs> I mean, that would be a real trickster move is to just be chaotic about it and not even say it. And just yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I heard you did, you know, something with Patrick and Mackenzie. It's like, what? so it's about tricksters, what's your thought? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, like, yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. It was really a pleasure. And yeah, as always, anyone, if you want to reach out to the show, you can do so through our email, right? At historiacanadiana at gmail.com. Um, you can also support the show through a variety of means that will be linked in the description. Um, you can mainly get extra episodes through Mackenzie's led Pop Canada, which comes out on Patreon every month. And as always, leave a five-star review, especially on this episode where him and Ish was on because it was fantastic. Um, so yeah, leave a review, send us an email. Hell, tell us if you want him and Ish on the show again. We'll be happy to have him um, <laughs> for a completely random topic. Topic, exactly. <laughs> maybe a topic where I might have fire knowledge. 
Nope, absolutely not. We'll be a real trickster move and just throw you into a topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we were going to talk about this, but we're not uh, talking about that stuff. Like, that would be such uh, a <laughs> that, that would be. Well, there you go. You'd have to recreate your entire knowledge base just on that. <laughs> yeah. So yep. thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone.